There we go. All right. So this is the the uh, the problem, right? One of the two that you were supposed to, or the, not supposed to, one of the two that you handed in, and they all look very good. I'm very happy that people are getting getting the circles to to look like circles. So that's I think that's a we're re really getting there. So I'm happy with that. Um, one thing that I've noticed though is this line here and this line here. Um, some of you did not really construct it seems some of them some of you decided that you just set what the height was here as four and then went from that right so you have basically if you look at this line and that line then you'll notice that and I'm <clears throat> sorry in some of your drawings that those are not parallel right if you kind of go and count down one two three four this would be just a little bit over one two three four just a little bit over, but many of you have this line coming all the way up to here. And so it looks, by first look, it looks more or less okay. But if you look at a little more detail, right, you'll see that this, that these two lines are not parallel. So the way that you should do this, right, is you should basically draw a construction line that starts here and is parallel to this line that goes, you know, like this all the way down and then find the intersection from this point going upward. But that's kind of what it is that you uh, that you should uh, be doing. Um, for the exam, uh, maybe just as we're on, on isometrics, what I'll be looking for is, of course, that all the lines are there and all the lines have the right length, right? That things like these things are parallel. Um, I'll be looking at the, when I look at the circles, right, I'll look at, does it fit into the bounding box? Um, and are the points where there's, I mean, don't draw them in, but like, is this, does the circle go through our, our main construction points, right? So is this point, does my circle go through here or did I put my construction point somewhere there right, to make it too short? So that's, those are things that, that I'll be, I'll be looking for on the exam. Now, are there any questions about any of the comments that I'm making on this one here? So it's really no. hard to see that if you're shaking your head or not, because I don't see any cameras. No, brother, there are no questions. And I see one camera. Let's have some cameras on. All right, the yeah. other thing that I wanted to point out is um is down here on um, this one on the dimension thing most of it looked very good remember that we tried to do kind of this baseline datum line type uh, dimensioning as much as we can um one thing that i've noticed though is that several of you did not dimension the arc here right you you dimensioned where where the center point would be but you didn't put the uh, the radius on here. So whenever we have an arc, every, anything that's curved on our system, we have to put like the radius or the diameter, depending on if it's a full circle or, or just an arc, right? So in this case, for this one, we put R5, and for this one, we'll put the diameter, right? So very, very important to, to have that in there. Now, if I define that this is a radius of five, then of course, I don't have to say that the distance from here to here, right? This this distance, I don't have to say that that's five because I've already saying it's an R five, right? So I don't have to say I don't have to draw another one that says that from here to there is twenty because I, I already know that, right? So we don't don't really have to put that one in. Um, so that would be kind of an overdimensioning if if we put that there, and remember that. We don't have to specify that this is 90 degrees because it looks like 90 degrees, right? So whenever something looks like 90 degrees, we'll assume that it is just that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out, two other things for dimensioning that I wanted to point out, and that is the first one is that we have to make sure that when we draw extension lines, that the extension lines extend all the way to where the feature is, right? So if I'm trying to dimension this, the distance from here up to there, 
right? Then I have to draw my dimension lines to this corner and to that corner. I can't just have it stop outside of my object, right? Because the extension lines can always go in. It's not, not an issue, right? So make sure that your extension lines are long enough, but of course don't touch, right? Has to be a little visible gap. What else? Oh, the other thing, the last thing that I wanted to point out is that even though on um, this kind of herky-jerky drawing up here, there's dimensions of how far the edge of the circle or the cylinder is away from, from the edge of the object, we never, ever, ever, ever dimension the distance like you know, of the circle to somewhere. Right? We always do the center mark. That's what we have the center mark for. Or if you think about um, this case it's a cylinder, but if it's a hole, right, it makes a lot of sense. We want to know where the hole, the center of the hole is, because that's where we're going to put our drill, right? If we want to drill the hole through our, our thing, how far the edges, we don't really care so much, right? It's about, about the hole. All right. Are there questions about dimensioning? If not, then let's get to our topic of the day. For that, let me share my, my presentation. There we go. I hope everybody can see my presentation. So today we are going to talk about tolerances. Um, today and on Tuesday, actually. So those two, two days of tolerances. Of course, in this case, tolerance is not so much that we're, we're uh, respectful of how crazy the people are around us, right? This is this is technical tolerances, right? That's basically saying that how much are we going to allow our part to be different from what we say uh, it's supposed to be, right? So in our case, um, we know that we can't manufacture something exactly, right? If we say this part is supposed to have a, this hole has to supposed to be, or is supposed to be a diameter of 0 0.5 millimeters, right? We know that, of course, we can't drill something at exactly 0 0.5 millimeters. There's always going to be some, some error to it, right? Because you can't even measure something exactly. Um, so that's why we have tolerance. So basically, that means that tolerance is the range that we'll accept, right? So if I have something that I designed to be a dimension of one millimeters, then um, and I'll accept anything that's 0 0.95 to 1.05 millimeters, then I know that my tolerance is 0 0.1 millimeters. Right? So that's the kind of difference between the upper limit and the lower limit would give us our tolerance. Now, in general, the tighter the tolerance, right? So the smaller that this number is, the 0 0.1, the more expensive it is to manufacture because we'll need tools that are more and more precise, right? So as we're designing things, we have to kind of keep in mind that, you know, we may have to have wider tolerances and able to produce stuff at a reasonable cost. Now, why are we concerned about tolerances? Well, a big reason why we are concerned about tolerances is because of interchangeability. And that is basically, if I design something, I want to make sure that I can use parts from other manufacturers as well, right? Say I have like, you know, a big, uh, big metal part or something, and there's a whole bunch of bolts that are going to go through certain holes in that system, right? So I'm, I want to be able to tell whoever's providing those bolts that those bolts have to have a certain um, or certain tolerance so that, that they'll fit into the holes in my system, right? Without um, buying a whole bunch of bolts that are then not going to fit because their tolerance was wider than, than the tolerance that I expected. Um, in some cases, uh, tolerances kind of, we, we live with the idea that two parts don't fit exactly together. Um, but they have to fit closely enough that they'll work. Right? And I think one of the best examples there is, is your phone and, and the charger, right? The charger cable is not supposed to be exactly the same size as the charger port, right? It has to be a little bit smaller so that it kind of fits in there, but it has to be big enough that it doesn't fall right back out. 
right? So it's not a not a mechanism holding it in place other than um, it is kind of the same, it's almost the same size. And that's another example, I guess, it, that you can use for for uh, interchangeability is because if you have, well, maybe not if you have an iPhone because only only Apple is allowed to produce those cables. Um, but you have, if you have an Android, right, then there's a gazillion different companies that will produce cables that will fit into your into your little uh, USB C port, right? So all of those have to have the same tolerances so that the cables don't fall out. And you will notice that sometimes when you buy replacement cables, that they were using different tolerances because all of a sudden, like you know, that cable doesn't hold in your phone very well, it keeps on falling out. Um, which is of course very annoying because then it's not charging when you think it's charging. Now with all these come of course standards, right? If we're saying that we're talking about interchangeability, we want to have different manufacturers using the same concepts of tolerances, that means we need to have standards, right? And there's a whole bunch of different standards. The main ones that we're gonna look at are the American National Standard Institute, Standards Institute, ANSI, we already talked about uh, ASME and then an ISO as well, right? So basically we'll have two sets of the two main sets of standards um, that will apply to metric and to uh, ISO only does metric, uh, ANSI and ASME do metric and, uh, and empirical. And we're gonna start with, uh, uh, with the empirical ones today and then, then on Tuesday we'll talk about uh, the metric ones. Um, at least for the details. For the general stuff, we'll talk about both now. Now, what? how do we express tolerance? Well, we have several different ways we can do this. We have the limits of dimensions, right? So we could say we want to have this hole be a diameter anywhere between 0 0.9 and 1.1. Um, sometimes we also write this with the diameter symbol in front and then the upper limit above the lower limit. Um, this is something you'll find more on drawings. This is going to be more in text, right? Because the text, of course, this is difficult to do. Another one that we have is what we call the bilateral tolerance, where we have some kind of a base value here. Also, we call this a nominal value. And then we have how far we're going to go up and how far we're going to go down, right? So this is not the limit. This would just be kind of, that's the number up and down, right? So if we think about this as limits, let me see if I can get my pen to work here. I have the big screen, sometimes that's tricky. Pen, right? So if I think about this as limits, right? So this would then be 10.02 and 9.99, right? If I think about this as, as written out as limits. Uh, sometimes we have what we call unila unilateral uh, tolerances, right? So the, the tolerance only goes in one direction, right? So in this case, uh, it only goes up and not down, right? So my, my lower limit would be exactly 10, or of course can be the other way around too, where my, in this case, my upper limit would be exactly 10. Uh, another one that people are quite familiar with usually is uh, the plus minus writing, right? That means I basically have the same limit going up and down. Um, and we see, especially this plus minus one, we often see on our drawings. So on our drawings, we will uh, sometimes have or often have what we call the tolerance block. And basically what that means that instead of writing on every number on our drawing, on every dimension we do like tolerances, we just say, well, everything that has uh, two decimals um, we'll have this very specific one. If it has three, if it has four, it looks like this, right? So again, if we say that my my nominal value was maybe 10, right? So that would be, um, oh, let's say 0 0.5, 10 is too big in this case, if it falls with zero, right? So if I have 0 0.50, that means my limits would be 0 0.51 and 0 0.49, right? Plus minus 0 0.01. If instead I had written on my uh, my drawing 0 0.5000, right? Same number, half is a half, right? 
but from a tolerance standpoint, that would mean my, my limits are now 0 0.5005. And zero point four nine nine five, right? Because I'm taking the upper and lower limit in this case. Questions so far? So far? Tolerances, limits up and down. Um, we'll get a little more practical in, in a minute here. Now we already talked about this in uh, when we talked about dimensions last week, or on two? Yeah. No, last week. Well, last week or was on Tuesday, I don't remember. Doesn't matter, right? But let's say I have this kind of stair part here. And let's say that for some functional reason, the distance between A and the distance between B would be very important, right? Something that I want to be very, very sure is correct. Now, if I have it, if I do the dimensions like this, then what would be the distance from A to B? like the uh, horizontal distance. What's the horizontal distance from A to B? Seventeen. Seventeen, yeah. All right, six plus six plus five is seventeen. What is it exactly seventeen? Nope. 17 plus, I don't know. Plus minus what? 0 0.3. Will be 0 0.3, right? Because worst case or worst case or best case, however you want to see it, right? One one potential will be that I have 6 plus 1, 6.1, 5.1, and 6.1, right? So I get 17.3, right? So this will be, this will be, um kind of we accumulate my my the tolerances here now we already said that we can solve that problem or we can reduce that problem by doing these the datum here right so on my datum one now how big is my distance from a to b Not early that early in the morning to do some simple simple math here. Seventeen, 17 plus, plus or minus zero point two. Exactly. Very good. Why zero point two? You are on mute. Yeah, sorry. Is that <laughs> Ale, Gloria, and me are together? So when yes. one of us talks, it's like a lot of echo. <laughs> yeah. But why why 0 0.2? Um, I don't know. I just need the oh no. Zero? I don't know how do you subtract them. You can think about it the same way. Right? It could be it could be I have my distance here it could be uh 13.1, right? That's a possibility. And this distance here could be, oops, that's not what I wanted. Yeah, so no, it would be 17 plus or minus like just zero. Well, because what I did was 24 minus seven. But if I do 24.1 minus 7.1. But, but could it also be 23.9? Right, plus plus minus one. They don't have to both be plus and both be minus. Right, so your your initial idea was correct. Right, so it could be that one of them goes in one direction, the other one in the other direction. If I subtract them, then I still get get the plus minus zero point two. Right, so whenever I have I have these tolerances, the the, the overall tolerances are going to you know, subtract. Right, so if I really want to have this to be exact then I should specifically do that distance, right? And in this case, we're not over-dimensioning because we took out the 24 that we had up here, right? The other one had a 24. We took that one out and we're just saying, this is exactly the distance that we want to have. Again, this is assuming that for some reason that that distance is very important to be exact, 
right? That has to have a, a high level of uh, of accuracy. All right, let's get into the most fun part of all this. And that is these standards are very particular about decimal points and how you write them. And they're, the annoying thing is that not only are they very particular, they are particular that metric and like empiric, like inches are different. They don't show up the same way. So let's start with, with uh, the metric ones. Right, so if I think about the unilateral dimensions, right? So again, I have my base, and then I have um, the value in one direction and zero, right? So in the metric system, it means that the number of decimals that the base has and that the limit has do not have to be the same, right? So I don't have to write 10.00 plus 0 0.02, I just do the 10. And also the zero does not have any decimals at all. Right? For the bilateral one, it's basically the same. It's just that now, of course, we don't have a zero. So we have to have give uh, decimals as well. The important part is that the decimals for those two limits have to be the same. right? So if the top one has, has uh, two digits after the decimal, then the lower one has to have two digits as well, right? If it's one, then, so if you just had one here and two there, that's not allowed. And then basically this holds throughout the metric system, right? So anytime I have limits, they have to have the same number of digits, um, and but the, the limits do not have to have the same number of digits as the decimal, right? The decimals often have uh, uh, fewer decimals. So that's the metric system. Now in the inches system, it's a little bit easier because basically everything has to have the same number of digits. All right, so you can see here the base has two uh, uh, digits after the decimal and the limits have the same thing. Even if it's a zero, it still has the two digits. All right, remember, for the metric one, we only had the zero, but here we have to have 0 0.00. And again, it doesn't matter if, like, you know, um, what type of dimensions, it's, it's always the same. The important thing in inches, again, is that we do not have a leading zero, right? So it's not 0 0.25, it's 0.25. And that goes for the other two as well, right? It doesn't change anything, again, the number of digits has to be the same, or the, the number of digits after the decimal point has to be the same, right? So we have one digit after the decimal point for the base, as well as for the limit. And then for angle, it's similar to what we have for inches, where the number of digits after the decimal has to be the same, both for the, the base and for the limits. And so maybe just as a Quick summary, right? So for the metric, the number of decimals can be different for the base and the limits, but the limits have to have the same number. Um, and then for the inches, they're all the same. There's no leading zero. And for the angles, everything's the same. There's, there's no leading zeros there. All right, so that's, that's one thing that you will, unfortunately, will have to get used to, right? This is one of the things that one of the little format things that I am actually gonna gonna require you to to abide by. Right? Usually, I'm not all that interested in these kind of things, but it's on these drawings. It's actually important to use the right the right formats. All right. So with that, we will come to the part where um, tolerances tend to be the most important or or the most applied. That is whenever I have a hole in my part and a some kind of a shaft that's supposed to fit into that hole. Um, we are gonna only talk about circular shafts and circular holes. Of course, we could have that with any other shape as well if we wanted to, right? But again, we are gonna focus, focus on circular systems here. And so basically, if we do a cross section, right, we'd have our hole here, our, our shaft here, um, the capital uh, diameter of the hole is, the maximum size that I have, right, so would be my base plus my upper limit, and the lowercase d would be the uh, the nominal minus the lower limit, right? And the same same for the shaft. 
And so again, we have the limits. So the upper and lower limits um, would be you know, for the shaft, it has a little shaft. Uh, D is the upper, uh, capital D is the upper, lowercase d is the lower. Um, then we have a basic size. So that's kind of the, the one that we're, we're basing the limits on. Um, usually this is a round number, right? Because that's something easy, easy to use. And then the tolerance is how much the uh, the um, diameter varies from the lower limit to the upper limit, right? That's just kind of some nomenclature. So let's do an example, right? So we have uh, some kind of part here that has a hole in it. We have a shaft that's uh, supposed to be in that hole. And we say for our shaft, we have the limits of 0 0.76, that will be the upper limit and 0 0.72 is the lower limit. And then for the hole, we have 0 0.75 and uh, 0.73 as your limits. Now, just from looking at that, is there something that you uh, kind of maybe think looks a little, little worrisome or strange? If you look about the limits for the shaft and the hole, Seems to be a lot of chatter going on, but not about the uh, shaft or the hole. Maximum there, right? limit of the shaft is greater than the maximum limit of the hole. Right, so potentially we have a system where my, whatever is supposed to fit in there is actually has a larger diameter than, than the hole, right? So I that potentially is a problem. We'll see in a little bit that actually that's not necessarily a problem. Sometimes you actually design systems that way because that that shaft is supposed to be in that hole and, and not come back out, right? Kind of a pin that's being held in place. All right. Now we often do this in these little tables, right? And you'll you'll fill out one of these tables or two of these tables as your your assignment today. Um, but if we just go through this example, right? So we have the shaft, the hole, we have limits, basic size, and tolerance, right? Those are the things that we've talked about. So if we think about the limits for the shaft, what are the limits for the shaft? Well, any, any suggestion about limits? This is the shaft. So what are the limits? 0. 0.72 and 0. 0.76. Exactly. All right, so we can put that in. Now, you will see that for the shaft, we put the larger number first, the upper limit first, and then the lower limit. For the hole, we do it the other way around. Now, again, this is one of those little quirks for in our system that we will have to abide by. Right? So when you fill out these tables, make sure that you write it the, the right way. And actually, this is not just for fun. We will see later on having it in that order makes it easier and less error prone for another calculation that we have to do. Right. So this is this is for a reason, not not just by chance. All right. So now we have our limits. So we have to find our basic size. What is the basic size? Right. That was kind of the size that is fits to is kind of in the range of both of them and is a is a, a round-ish number. What should we choose as our as our base, our basic size? 0 0.74. That'd be the average of most of these, but 0 0.74 is not, not the most round number that I can think of that's in that general vicinity. What's a number that comes to mind that is a little more a common used number, I guess? 0 0.75. 0 0.75, so 0 0.75, right? Or, or three quarters, right? This is this is a, a very basic number. And if I go to the hardware store, I can find I can find bolts or pins or whatever that are, are 0 0.75. Finding them for 0 0.74 
is going to be more difficult. Right? I'll have to have somebody actually produce them for me, which obviously it's always better to get stuff off the shelf than produce it yourself because it's cheaper. Right? So this is the basic size. We will we will find out uh, when we look at the uh, at the standards that actually usually the basic size shows up somewhere. Right, so one of these four limits usually is the basic size. In this case, again, it was 0 0.75. <clears throat> All right, so then what are the tolerances that we get for the shaft? How will we get the tolerance for the shaft? Right, the tolerance, again, was, was the range, the possible range that I'm, I'm allowed. So it would be 0 0.76 minus 0 0.72. Exactly, right? Be zero, be, I have to be careful. I shouldn't say zero, it's be 0 0.04, right? Very, very important. There's no leading zero, right? Because this is all inches. And then for the hole, what do we get for the hole? 0 0.02. Exactly, right? Get 7.75 minus 0.73 which gives us 0 0.02, right? very, very easy uh, math. Now the tolerances are always uh, gonna be positive numbers, right? There's no, no negative tolerance. All right, so that was our first little table. Um, then we have to make another definition. This another definition is what we call the maximum and minimum or least material condition. And basically is we have to choose the diameter that leads to the most or the least material, All right? So if I think about the shaft, is does my upper limit or my lower limit give me the most material in my in the in the object in the part? Which of these two pins or bolts or whatever they are has more material? Uh, the big one. one with a capital D, right? Of course, right? The bigger my upper limit is going to be the bigger the bigger shaft, right? So the bigger the diameter, the more material. How about for my my uh, part that has a hole in it? Which of those two parts there has the same has the, the has more material? The small D. A smaller one, right? Because I make a, a smaller hole, I'll, I'll take out less material. And the real fun thing is that if I remember drawing these, then of course those two outer boxes are exactly the same size, right? Looks like the one with a cap with a lowercase d is a smaller, smaller part, but that's just a visual, uh, visual trick, right? All right, so we have these conditions, right? So we know that. They're basically the opposite between holes and shafts, right? The bigger the diameter for my shaft, the more material, the smaller the diameter of my hole, the more material is left, right? So that's, these are what we call the maximum uh, material conditions. And we're gonna use them, oops, wait, two little circles around them, right? So we, this is just writing it out, right? The maximum we call MMC. So that's the maximum diameter for the shaft and the minimum diameter for the hole. And for the LMC, it's it's the opposite uh, around, right? So, but very, very logical stuff. So let's do that for our um, for our example here. Right? I already have one of them, right? So the maximum material condition for our shaft is 0.76, and then that of course means the least one is zero point is 0.72. So now, what is the uh, MMC for my hole. 0 0.73. 0 0.73. All right, and then of course the max is 0 0.75. Everybody understand how we're stepping through this? All right, so yeah. the maximum material condition is the maximum shaft and the minimum hole. All right, and basically the reason why we do this is because we want to see what happens <clears throat> What happens if I have, if I run into that exact condition, right? Where I have, if I have the, the maximum shaft um, and the minimum hole, right? Then we can see potentially we have an issue, right? Because my shaft is going to be uh, larger than the hole. If I do it the other way around, right? Then my shaft is going to be smaller than my hole. 
but that's we're going to use that to classify uh, different things. We're going to use that to classify what we call clearance, right? So we talk about the maximum clearance, which is the least material condition hole minus shaft, or easier said, it's the largest hole and the smallest shaft, right? You can, if you wanted to have an easy way for that for the the shaft to to fit into the hole, right? Then you can say this would be the um, the best case scenario, right? Of my possible holes that I have, I'm going to choose the largest one, and of the possible shafts, I'm going to choose the smallest one, right? So this is the, the if it's going to fit here, it's always going to fit, basically, kind of idea. Uh, the other way around, the minimum clearance, we also sometimes call call that allowance, would be the worst case scenario, right? I'm taking, I'm choosing the smallest possible hole that's within my range and the largest possible shaft, right? So now if that doesn't fit, then I know that I'm potentially in trouble. Right? If this still fits, then I know that, that I'm, I'm good. All right, let's try that here, right? I already put one of them in, right? So my maximum clearance would be my largest hole, Right and my smallest uh, uh, shaft. Right, so seven point uh, point seven five minus point seven two gives me point oh three. And then for the other one, right, I would say my uh, in this case my smallest possible hole minus my largest possible shaft. Right, and then I'll see that I actually get a negative number. <clears throat> in this case. Unlike the tolerances, there are negative numbers, right? So it's very important if this number is positive or negative. So I know that my max clearance is 0.03, and the minimum clearance would be negative 0.03. And then we use this, positive or negative, to come up with some definitions. We call this the type of fit. So if both the max clearance and the min clearance are positive, Right, that means there was ample space between them. Then we call that just clearance. This is the case where the if you want to call it a peg or whatever fits into the design hole without any issues. Right? It might actually have a little little wiggle room left, <clears throat> regardless of if I choose the smallest or, or the largest possible one. The other one we call the uh, the transition fit, and that is that the maximum clearance is positive, but the minimum clearance is negative, right? That means that under certain conditions, right? So if if my shaft is on the small size and my hole is on the big size, then it's, it fits. But if it's the other way around, then it's not gonna fit anymore, right? Or it's not gonna be easily fit. I'll have to force it in. Um, and then if both are negative, then we call that interference, uh, or if the max clearance is zero and the other one is negative, call that interference. If the max one is positive and the min one is zero, then we call that a line fit, but we're not line fits, we're not going to use all that much, right? So that the three that are important are the clearance, the transition, and the interference. Right. You can kind of think about this uh, almost like the clearance is the one where it fits in regardless, like no, no issues. Uh, the transition is where under some or you know, some of the ones that I'm going to produce are going to fit, uh, others are not. And the interference ones are are none of them are going to fit, right? And we'll see in a minute that that none of them fitting is not not necessarily a a design flaw, right? That might be actually on, on purpose. <clears throat> All right. So what, what does that look like, right? So this is taken straight from from the uh, the um, from the from the design standard, right? So again, we have our our holes, we have the shaft. For the clearance fit, right, we can see that, or maybe I should describe, right, so like the, the, the white kind of area would be the, um, the min size, the min diameter, and uh, if we add the black area, then it's what it has, the, the, the full diameter, of course, should be on both sides, but they're just drawing it on one side to make it easier. The same for the shaft, right, so in this case, if I even if I go with the shaded area on both sides, my part is still going to fit. Right, it's still going to slide in. Now, if I go for the transition one, if I do the shaded for both of them, they're not going to fit. But if I do the shaded for just the hole and not for the pin, right, then the pin is going to fit. 
if I do the shaded area just for the whole, uh, not the pin, then it also still fits. But if I choose both shaded areas, then it's no longer going to fit. That's why we call it the transition. And then for the interference, we can see that regardless, like even if I take off the two shaded areas in both for both the shaft and the hole, this part is not going to fit. Or you know, depending on how I draw this, maybe it just fits, right? But then it would be exact, which is always hard to get. Now, why do we care? Well, some systems, some parts that we design actually depend on this fit to work properly, right? So one of them, one example would be the door and the door frame, right? Door and a door frame, they have to fit with clearance, right? There has to be always a little bit of space between my door and my door frame, or it'd be hard to uh, open and close my door. And this is something that I think is very interesting that, that we run into Costa Rica all the time, and you may notice that, is that you might have a desk made out of wood, and that drawer fits perfectly well for a good part where like the drawer that comes in and out is easy to open and close for part of the year, and not so easy to uh, open and close uh, the rest of the year. And so what's happening is that when it's the dry season, right, the wood shrinks just a little bit because it's drying, right? The wood expands and contracts with being, with, with the moisture in the air. So it will contract just a little bit in the dry season. And so it's easy to open that drawer up uh, in and out. But once the moisture goes up in the air, that wood just expands a little bit. So both the drawer and the surrounding would expand a little bit. And so all of a sudden, those drawers start sticking, right? That's something that happens all the time. The door hinges are, are another one, right? We want to have those door hinges move freely against each other so I can open the open the uh, open and close the door. Uh, a key and a keyhole, of course, we want to have that key go into the keyhole easily, right? We don't have to use a hammer to get it in there. Um, ones that uh, work on interference, right? If you think about the, the chain of a bicycle, right? The kind of the drive drivetrain part. Um, there's little pins that hold the little pieces of the chain together. And of course, once they're in there, they're supposed to stick in there, right? That's not, there's not a screw that I tighten or something. It's just a pin that gets hammered in there. And once it's in, it's supposed to stay in, right? If it just kept on falling out, my chain would fall apart all the time. And then I think you've all, had like you know as a little kid maybe like a little workbench or something with big wooden pegs to hammer into right those are also set in a way that they don't uh, work through now if you think about the other wooden toy where you have the shapes that are supposed to fit through then that's that's a different thing of course right those would be all clearance fits now when i was uh probably about your age they had a had a great a great commercial for, I don't know why, I don't remember what the commercial's for. I just uh, remember the commercials, basically a little kid taking uh, a square peg and hammering it into a round hole and was something about, like, you know, for people who think differently or something like that, right? So what, that's always a good one. Feel like I'm losing a lot of cameras here. I think I'm down to one camera again. I'm not sure uh, if there's a light outage or something on campus so nobody can see anything anymore but I'd like to have those cameras on. All right, so let's talk about fit with these in a little more detail. What do we, what can we do here? So we have a set of examples, shaft limits and hole limits, and we're supposed to find the basic size and the fit. So for the first one, what should we choose as a basic size? 1.250. Uh -huh, all right, but I have to be careful because we have to stick with the same number of digits, right? So it'll be 1.250, but the number is correct, right? That's a good one. So what do we say about the fit? I right, remember the fit, we have to find the min and the max clearance, right? The And we were going to get those by subtracting basically the limits of the whole from the limits of the shaft, right? So in our case, we take the biggest hole, so that'd be 1.250, and we subtract the smallest shaft, which is 1.249. And this is now 
why we write the shaft flip the ramp, right? This is why we write the shaft, the large number first and the small number second, so that this, this uh, little subtraction here becomes easier to make, right? I have to just do the second two and the first two. So if I subtract the first two, oh, I just didn't, didn't write the numbers in, right? But if I subtract um, the first one, right, that I would have uh, 1.250 minus 1.249 gives me a positive number. If I do the second one, 1.248 minus 1.252 gives me a negative number. Positive negative means transition. All right, how about the second one? What's my basic size? 0.50. 0 0.50, exactly. And then what would be my fit? What's my first condition? My first condition is the largest hole minus the uh, smallest shaft. Does that give me a positive or a negative number? Point 0.5 minus point 0.5, one. Negative. That's a negative number, all right? For the other one, right, I take the smallest hole, 0.49 minus 0.454. What does that give me? Also negative. Negative. What is negative and negative? Remember what the name was? Interference. Interference. Right. That's that's what we get. With interference, it's always we can we can basically jump ahead if we want to, right? We can say if the largest hole um, is smaller than the, uh, the smallest shaft, right, then we already know it's interference. We don't even have to do the second calculation, but those calculations are easy. All right, then the third one, what do we get there for our, for our fit, or for our basic size, I'm sorry. 0 0.75. 0 0.75, very good. And what type of fit do we get? What's the first one? Transition. No, it would be line because it's from positive to zero. No. Exactly. Um, right. So we would we would call that a line. But if you want to call it, if, if you call, want to call that transition, that's that's fine too. But technically, it's it's uh, it's a line fit because it's a like that 0.75 and 0.75 are the same. Number. So even though it's a line, uh, it can also be a transition. Right, because the transition was that like you know one is one is positive, one is negative. If you want to count the zero as positive, then, then you could call that transition. But usually for that special case, just because it is a special case, we call it a line fit. But you will see that in the in the standards, we usually are, are restricted to transition interference and uh, and transition. Okay. All right. How about the last one? The basic size would be one, right? Exactly. Right? But if you write it down, I have to remember we always have to have the, the same number of digits. So writing it down will be one point zero zero zero. Looks strange, but but we we have to be precise there. And then what kind of fit do we have? Clearance. Exactly, right? Because we have both of them are going to be positive, right? 1.004 minus 0.998 is positive, and then 1.002 minus that one's also positive. So we get clearance, All right? So this is nice, nice and straightforward, I think, right? So pretty easy calculation. Remember that we write for the shaft limits, we do the, 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 uh, the second one or the larger one first. So that that calculations become easier, right? So again, basically you can start from here, say this one minus that one, and then that one minus that one. Really, really straightforward. Now, for all this, we are gonna use one of the ANSI standards. And if you want to go and look them up, the ANSI standard is right there. That's the one that we're gonna be using. We're gonna be using some tables to do this. Um, you can find those tables in the back of the, the textbook that you have the link for. 
Um, if you, annoyingly enough, uh, ANSI is one of those standardization agencies that likes to sell their stuff. So if you want to get the exact tables uh, from the source, you'll have to pay whatever they're, they're looking for. But you can also find those tables online everywhere. Um, now, uh, ANSI defines a set of uh, five different fits, um, RC, LC, LT, LN, and FN. And you can see them all written out here of what, what they would mean, right? So we basically have two types of clearance, the transition interference, and then one that's really interference, right? So something that we really have to do something to get them in there, right? So force and shrink fits basically means that we're probably not going to get that in there other than like hammering really hard or uh, expanding or contraction through uh, through temperature changes, right? Remember that's uh, one of the reasons why people, when they built the first skyscrapers, right, we put those pins to hold everything together, uh, those bolts, and those were put in glowing hot so that they would expand later on and, and, and harden, of course, um, as well. Right? All right, so let's see what the standard basically looks like. Well, the standard looks like a set of tables, and they all have um, the same layout, of course. So they will have over here in the first column, they'll have the nominal size and then the range, and all this is in inches, right? So this column right here is good for anything where the nominal size is between zero and 0 0.12. Now, why in these tables they have the leading zeros, I do not know. Nobody's been able to tell me why they don't leave them up. I think it's just for readability. But if you want to be super technical, they shouldn't be in there. Now we have this. So this is our first column. That's kind of where we kind of start looking. And then we'll see that we have these indicators here. We have LC1, LC2, LC3, and so on and so on. I cut the table off here. So when we produce a part, we will be told that produce a hole in a shaft, whatever, right? Produce a bolt that has a basic size of 0.25 and an LC2 fit. So what we would do is we would go into our table and then find the numbers in here to know what the limits are, right? So instead of telling somebody, I want a basic size of 0.25 and an upper limit of this and a lower limit of that, right? That's a lot of numbers, a lot of information to write. It's easier just to put, it's an LC2, and then that's, we're going to find what that is. Now, very, very, very important. I always have a couple of students that on, on the assignment will, will miss this, is the numbers that are given here as the limits, right, kind of the, the tolerance parts of the limits, they are given in a thousandth of an inch, right? So it's not basic plus this, it is basic plus this number here divided by a thousand, right? And we'll go through an example in a minute. But let's let's look at what this would be, right? So let's say we have a basic size of 0.25 and an LC2 fit. So the first thing we'll have to do is we'll have to go through our, our standard. We have to leaf through our standard until we find LC2, right? In this case, LC2 would be right here. We're given a basic size of 0.25, all right? We go in our table. Where does it fall? Well, it falls between 0 0.24 and 0 0.440, right? So we know this is the right row for us to look in. And then we look to where our LC2 is. So now we know that for our hole, my, um, my upper and lower limits are 0 0.6 divided by 1,000 and 0. And for the shaft is 0 and minus 0 0.04 divided by a thousand, right? So if I wanted to, we could do that for any other one. I'm not sure why I've changed my example here, but if I do a basic size of one and use an LN2 fit, right? Then I could go in and I could say, well, my hole, again, uh, the upper and lower limits, right? We said we're, we're 0 0.8, we look here, right? 0 0.8 and zero, 0 0.8, I guess the lower limit is minus, right? You do it there. And then the upper one would be 1.3 and 0 0.8. Put that in here. So my, my lower limit for the hole is going to be my basic minus, well, the lower one is zero. So it doesn't matter. It's going to be the same. Uh, the upper limit now is going to be 1 plus 0 0.8. But remember, it has to be divided by 1,000. 
right? So instead of plus 0 0.8, so it's not the upper limit is 1.8, right? Almost twice as big. No, 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 it's 1.0008. And in these tables, even if it's 0, 0, 0, 0, we have to write all these zeros, right? Because that, that gives us an idea of what the, the accuracy is. For the shaft, the same thing. So we'd be 1 plus 0, 0, 0008 gives me this number. 1 plus 0, 0, 0013 gives me this number, right? So with that, I would have all my, all my values. And I can go in and figure out what, what all the things are. All right, does that make make sense? Whole bunch of math that's very simple. Just have to choose the right number and you have to choose the right formats, right? It has to be looking correct in the format. All right, so if that all makes sense, then I have two tables for you to fill out. Um, one that has... Um, one you don't even have to have the uh, the standard for gives you all the numbers here, right? So I want you to have a system where the largest shaft is 0 0.505, the smallest shaft is 0.496, the largest hole is 0 0.523, and the smallest hole is 0 0.507. Right? And I want you to fill out this entire the entire table. Remember that in this table, and the text that does the format doesn't matter. In the text, in the table, I'm sorry, the format does matter. Right? So make sure that you put in, uh, don't put leading zeros and all that kind of stuff. Does everybody understand how to approach the table? All right? Also, I think on the, uh, or, no, I think on the blackboard and blackboard that like you can just download the, the PDF that has these tables in them, right? So you can just just fill them out. Um, you can fill them up by hand and and send them in or type them in however you want to do that. Um, the second practice is now using the uh, the standard to fill out this table right here. And so I'm telling you to use a basic size of 1.25 inches and fit a fit of LT3. Right, so for that, again, you have to go to the appendix of your book and look where LT3 is, and then you can fill out this, this table right here. It right? gives the limits for the shaft and the hole. Remember, uh, for both of these tables, for the shaft, we start with the big number, upper limit, lower limit. For the hole, we do lower limit, upper limit, which is kind of how we usually write our numbers, right? Large, large to big. But for the shaft, it's the other way around. Then you give the tolerances, the uh, maximum material uh, condition and the least material condition, max clearance, min clearance, and then type of fit. All very straightforward. All right, with that, I will let you start doing this. Um, and if you have questions, please go ahead and ask them. I'll stop recording for now because that's a good enough.